Chapter Two of Aristopia by Castello Newton Holford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Captain Newport was not only a member of the Colonial Council, but as the medium of communication between the Virginia Company in London and the Council at Jamestown, he enjoyed particular importance. Even Captain Smith, so imperious with the rest, deferred much more to Newport than to the President of the Council, and represented him to the Indians as his father. Newport very much desired to conciliate the great chief of that region, whom the English called King Powhatan. By the way, the name Powhatan was not only the name of the chief, but the Indian name for the whole region and its inhabitants, and for the river which the English called the James. Newport did not like Smith's masterful way of acquiring ascendancy over the Indians, but thought liberal and ostentatious presents the best way. Immediately on his arrival he sent by messenger some presents to Powhatan, and as soon as the pinnace could be got ready in a style to suit his ideas, he set out to visit the great chief, taking with him Captain Smith and Matthew Scrivener, who had just come over and had immediately been elected a member of the council, and a party of forty men, of whom Ralph Morton was one. Powhatan's residence was at Warawakamoko on the Pamunkey River, since called the York, only twelve miles from Jamestown over land, but Newport concluded to go by water. Arrived near the Indian town, Newport's heart failed him as he thought of trusting himself among the warriors of the redoubtable chief. Smith, to reassure him, landed with twenty men, among them Morton, and proceeded to Powhatan's village, which was some distance from the river. There were some small but deep and miry creeks to cross, over which the Indians had made frail bridges composed of poles laid in crotches stuck in the mire. These Smith suspected to be traps, but was reassured by making some of his Indian guides go over them first. Arrived at the village, two or three hundred savages conducted the Englishmen into Powhatan's presence. The chief had arranged his greatest pomp for the occasion. He was seated on a bed of mats with a leather pillow embroidered with pearls and beads made of bits of shell. He was attired in a robe of furs. At each side, close by him, sat one of the fairest of his harem, and farther away, twenty of his women, their faces and arms stained red with pocony root, and about their necks great chains of shell beads. As an emblem of his hospitality, forty wooden platters full of cornbread were arranged in two rows, one on each side of the door. Powhatan caused a proclamation to be made that on pain of death none was to molest any of his guests. The acquaintance begun between Smith and the chief during the former's captivity was renewed in a long conversation. Then the chief entertained his guests with the dancing and barbarous dramatic performances of his women, and with a feast, and gave them lodging for the night. The next day Newport, being informed that all was well, came ashore. The party spent three or four days at the place. Usually the Indian chiefs would not allow their men to trade with the whites until they, the chiefs, had done their trading. But this time Powhatan would not trade until the last. Then he said to Newport, through Smith as interpreter, it does not befit my greatness to haggle with you about each separate trifle. Lay all your goods in a heap, and I will take what pleases me, and give you what I think it is worth. A right royal trader is this, said Smith, with a twinkle of the eye. He will please himself, I assure you, but the trade he will make you will little pleasure or advantage you. Rather put the boot on the other leg— Tell the cunning old rascal to measure out twenty hogsheads of corn, and you will give him such trinkets as you think is right. Nay, nay, said Newport, rather let us outbrave the barbarian with the greatness of our generosity, and so bewitch him with our bounty, as we may have what we list of his. 
"'Not at all,' said Smith. "'You will find the savage's desire unsatiable. "'You will give him such a conceit of himself "'as will make him think himself everything and us nothing.' "'But Newport gave the chief his way, "'and the latter helped himself liberally to the English goods "'and gave in return about four bushels of corn.' Newport, who had expected enough to supply his whole colony, looked aghast. "'Corn were better cheap in Spain,' said Smith dryly. Then, as if carelessly, he let the chief see some bright blue beads, and, in answer to the chief's inquiry, informed him that such ornaments were only for great kings, and that he would not part with them, as he wanted to keep them for the kings of the Monacans and Massawomeks, mortal enemies of the Powhatans. In the end, the old chief became so determined to have the beads that he gave about two hundred and fifty bushels of corn for them. Leaving Powhatan, Newport's party visited Opechancana, Powhatan's brother who ruled over the Pamunkeys, and supplied him and his harem with these royal blue beads for a large amount of corn and then returned to Jamestown with their supply. The newcomers were quartered in the cabins with the first settlers, whose number had been so thinned by death. For a while they were quite comfortable, in spite of the extreme cold weather. But one night some of the roistering gallants got to throwing firebrands around and set fire to one of the thatched roofs. In a few minutes the little village was in a raging conflagration. Every house was burned, and the stockade was destroyed in many places. Some even lost their bedding in the confusion. Ralph Morton was well supplied with blankets, and had presence of mind enough to get them out of the burning cabin, and to carry them and his little chest down to the water's edge to escape the intense heat. But his little shelf of books was destroyed. The chaplain of the colony, Mr. Robert Hunt, had a considerable library which was destroyed, to his great grief, and not a little to Ralph's sorrow, as the good parson was almost as much pleased to loan the books to Ralph as to use them himself. Fortunately, most of the corn remained still in the pinnace, and most of the stores in the ship, or the colony would soon have starved outright. End of chapter 2